Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Vortex, where lies and falsehoods are trapped and exposed. I'm Michael Voris. As Church Milton continues to dig deeper into the case of Detroit priest Father Edward Perone and the Archdiocese's severe mishandling of it, a number of disturbing facts are coming to light. Let's start with the actual members of the Archdiocesan Review Board itself, that body which decided to rule against Father Perone and go public with his smearing in the statement where Archbishop Alan Vigneron and his staff refused to let Father Perone declare his innocence. The webpage for the six-member review board proudly announces its independence from the archdiocese. But just how independent is it, actually? First, retired Michigan Circuit Court Appeals Judge Michael Talbot is the chairman of the board. Oddly enough, he is also a member of the law firm which represents the Archdiocese, Bodman, the most expensive law firm in the state, or one of them. The question needs to be asked right off the bat, how is a review board independent from the Archdiocese when its chairman also legally represents the Archdiocese? That connection reeks of a conflict of interest. He gets paid by the very firm that makes decisions to protect the interests of the Archdiocese and Archbishop Alan Vigneron. Not victims, not the accused, but the Archbishop. Another questionable member regarding the board's so-called independence is the former head of the Child Abuse Unit for Wayne County's Prosecutor's Office, Nancy Deal. Nancy Deal is the blood sister of the ranking member at Bodman, Robert J. Deal. So on a six-member board, of which some members are clergy, at least two, one-third, have direct ties to the archdiocesan law firm. How can this be anything else other than a conflict of interests? As Church Milton broke exclusively a couple of months ago, Judge Michael Talbot, the chairman of the review board, was accused by law enforcement of trying to shut down the investigation of the notorious Father Robert DeLand in Saginaw with claims that he threatened local prosecutors. How is this in any way an independent board? When given a case which comes before them, at least two members have only one concern in their mind, whatever is in the best interest of the archdiocese, not the victim, not the accused. This is grossly unfair and unjust. Also deeply involved is Monsignor Michael Bugarin, who is Vigneron's Episcopal vicar and delegate for matters of clergy misconduct. Bugarin also is listed as part of the support staff assisting the board in its activities. What? In that capacity, we don't even know really, he may actually be pushing for the accusation against Father Perone and any accused priest to go forward, again, not with the accused interests in mind at all, but the archdiocese's best interest exclusively. The more you learn about the alleged independent review board, the more you see what looks like a kangaroo court come into focus, with the deck already being stacked. Again, not necessarily in favor of the victim or the accused, but just the archdiocese. Why are Vigneron's attorneys sitting on an independent review board? Why are decisions being made by Vigneron's priests as how to proceed against or in favor of any given case? After all, what priest is going to potentially anger his bishop by pushing for something, let's say acquittal, or a solid defense of an accused priest, whichever way, and the archbishop doesn't approve of that? The truth is, the independence of this board is little else than a rumor, with archdiocesan attorneys and chancery officials running the show, chancery officials who might have an axe to grind against an accused clergy member. And... Every time a violation of procedural or substantive law regulating clergy sexual misconduct accusations and their canonical review is committed by a diocesan official, for example, the publication of an accused priest's name on a list on the diocesan website, the presumption of impartiality of any process is completely undermined and reversed, turned on its ear, like they did with Father Perone. We aren't saying Bugarin has an axe to grind, just that given all the errors and the incompetence he has demonstrated as Episcopal vicar and delegate of the archbishop in matters of clergy sexual misconduct, he should not be dealing with the board. 
In fact, he should resign immediately, and if he does not resign voluntarily, his decree of appointment should be immediately revoked by Archbishop Vigneron if either one of them had any honor. This is calling into great focus the severe problems and issues with this whole process. In fact, the very process we are talking about here is the one laid out by the near-infamous Dallas Charter and what are now called the Essential Norms, revised by the U.S. bishops in 2006. But the reality is that that entire process was actually born in the twisted mind of and assembled by, in large part, the serial homo predator Theodore McCarrick, and, as we can now surmise reasonably, designed to protect bishops from scrutiny against charges of sexual malfeasance. As for accused priests, oftentimes the essential norms are weaponized against good priests that a bad bishop wants to simply sideline. The essential norms are not some neutral document. They are a powerful tool. Like fire, they can be used rightly or wrongly. When given a review board appointed by the local bishop in a given diocese wants to go after a bad priest or neutralize a good one, the essential norms are one big weapon. The grumbling has gotten so loud among good priests about the abuse of the essential norms that many are beginning to hope that the Father Perone case will be the impetus for a long, hard look at it again by the nation's bishops, with giving them a serious makeover. Through a series of strange coincidences, Church Militant came to know the identity of the accuser of Father Perone many weeks ago. We're not at liberty to say how we came into possession of the information, but we know and have known since at least May. The case, as it was relayed to us weeks and weeks ago, was so odd that after digging, we dismissed it as not credible. Which brings us to the word credible, used in Archbishop Vigneron's statement to describe the single 40-year-old charge against Father Perone. The word credible, which Monsignor Bergeron bandies about freely, is for all intents and purposes in American diocesan chanceries a very dangerous word because it is being commonly employed in an alleged clergy misconduct case in an entirely different way than authorized by canon law. In regular usage, you and I, when we talk about this, it means exactly what it sounds like. If you say something's credible, eh, it's worthy of belief. But in the arcane language of canon law, it is a higher standard than what Canon 1717 of the Code of Canon Law actually requires as a criterion to be used, which is a semblance of truth. That is a positive determination, not a negative one. This gets a little into the weeds here, but allow us to explain because it's important. God is, after all, in the details. Currently, American diocesan officials are using the terminology, quote, unless an allegation be manifestly false or frivolous, close quote, as the definition of a credible allegation. This non-canonical definition actually shifts the burden of proof to the accused priest to demonstrate, not just allege his defense, that any allegation made against him was manifestly, obviously, evidently false or frivolous, as opposed to the diocese actually having positive or affirmative evidence in support of a claim of sexual abuse. That is a vast difference between common chancery Orwellian newspeak and the official canonical criteria legislated by the popes over many centuries. When Archbishop Vigneron and his non-independent review board and Monsignor Bigarin approved the use of the language against Father Perone, the public language, that the charge had a semblance of truth, that is grossly misleading. In reality, the term semblance of truth, according to the AOD itself, in its own documents, is defined as it is not manifestly false or frivolous or serious or substantive. Again, the phrase semblance of truth in canon law carries a vastly different meaning. It does not mean that any allegation is credible unless it can be rebutted as manifestly false or frivolous by the accused priest. However, according to the AODs and most diocesan sex abuse policies currently in effect, the practical bar that needs to be crossed in a case like this is extremely low, so low, in fact, that it's laughable. So for Archbishop Vigneron to approve a press release with language like credible, 
and semblance of truth is massively disingenuous and dangerous and a misleading account taken of what those terms actually mean in the context of the AOD's own actual policies, practices, and posted Q&As found online on its own website. In short, they deliberately let the public think they mean something that they themselves say they don't mean. Church Militant, knowing details of this charge from months ago, know that the claim that was brought forward came from a repressed memory, something extremely dubious and, according to the majority of expert psychologists, far from credible, and credible meaning common speak credible. Archbishop Vigneron and his independent review board knew this as well. They knew what the charge was, which begs the question, why would a review board comprised in large part of Vigneron's attorneys decide to accept a dubious claim and then make a very public show of yanking him from public view and give the Associated Press an interview during the investigation and announce the allegation with all the bells and whistles it could muster, deliberately using misleading definitions for the canonical term semblance of truth and have hundreds of millions be exposed to the story in the secular media and not even offer Father Perone an opportunity to, at the very least, deny the allegation publicly and claim his innocence publicly. Something is not right with this case, the charge, the handling of it, the review board's treatment of it, especially the review board's handling of it. Something is not being told here about the review board's approach to this case their rationale. Frankly, it seems like something is being covered up here or covered over or dodged or trying to be swept under the rug. And Vigneron's hitman, Bugarin, his nonstop appeal to the process, isn't cutting it. The process in this case does not just appear to have been corrupted. It manifestly has been corrupted in violation of the Pope's own recently publicized guidelines and the canon law of the Catholic Church. This is the anatomy of the takedown of a highly respected priest, ladies and gentlemen, a sleight of hand using deceptive language, using the words, but switching their meanings. Church Milton is developing multiple leads on this case even now, speaking with archdiocesan staff who actually know a great deal about this case and the history. Rest assured that we will not rest until all the malfeasance infecting this process like the one injuring Father Perone are exposed because there is something very big and unseemly here to expose. God love you. I'm Michael Boris. 